Today we're going to cover some of the finer points of the formulas we use for statistical tests. Stay tuned. Some of you have been following along on this channel and learning how to do some statistical tests and you started to contact me and say, hey, you're making this too easy for other people. I get it, I get it. Knowing how to do statistics is a valuable and marketable skill and you don't want other people having such an easy time to cut into your business. So what can we do about it? Well, there's a few things you can do to make sure that the statistics that you do seem so complicated that people will just think it's basically magic. As you've probably gathered by this point from watching my standard deviation video and my Z and T test video, there's really only a couple of things that you actually have to learn how to do in order to understand statistical tests. You need to be able to calculate a sum of squares. You need to understand degrees of freedom. You need to be able to understand variance, the standard deviation, and the standard error. And that gets you pretty much where you wanna be for these statistical tests. The good news is a lot of these are built on one another such that you use the sum of squares and degrees of freedom to calculate the variance. You use the variance to calculate the standard deviation and you use the standard deviation to calculate the standard error. But one thing you'll notice about these is that you can represent these in more than one way. For example, degrees of freedom is sometimes symbolized as DF or N minus one. The standard deviation is sometimes a lowercase s and sometimes it's SD, uppercase. We can use this kind of uh, shell game with different symbols of how we talk about things to really make those formulas seem more complicated and keep people on their toes when they're trying to learn about statistics. The second thing we can do is we can think about how these are used to generate one another and we can substitute in terms that are kind of odd or different to make things look more complicated than they actually are. So think about wheat. Wheat can be ground into flour. Flour can be milled into pasta. And then pasta can be cooked into spaghetti. But it doesn't matter what you're talking about when you're talking about spaghetti, you're still talking about something that essentially has the same raw ingredients. However, notice that if you made pasta and somebody said, hey, what's in this? And you said flour, that would be a very odd way to describe the spaghetti. We can do the same kind of thing with our statistical tests. For example, the raw data gets built into basic statistics like the mean and sample size, which then get calculated into other statistics like the variance and the standard deviation, the standard error. Those get transformed into things like statistical tests like T or Z or chi-squared and things like effect size. So when we go to make formulas, we can keep in mind that we have formulas for both the uh, later components but also the original pieces of the puzzle. So let's look at an example. So if we look at the formula for a sum of squares, it's sum of or sigma x minus x bar squared. The degrees of freedom is simply n, or the sample size, minus one. Now, of course, you know that the variance is simply the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. So if I wanna symbolize my variance as s squared, I can represent the formula for s squared in two ways. The first way is I can say the variance is equal to the sum of squares, ss, divided by the degrees of freedom. The second way is I could say the variance is equal to the sum of squares, sum of x minus x bar squared, divided by the degrees of freedom, n minus one. So these two are mathematically equivalent, they're the same, I'm just substituting how I label the top and bottom. Now that I have my variance, I can add that formula to my list up here, and I can calculate a standard deviation. The standard deviation we can represent, because it's further down the line, in more ways than we could even the variance. So we could represent the standard deviation as the way I did in my standard deviation video, the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared divided by n minus one, which of course we could just replace those with simpler labels 
the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. Or if you want to get even more simple, then you can say the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance. The point is we can take all these equivalent statements and mix and match and swap them in and out. That way you can write the same formula a whole bunch of different ways. This really confuses people and it'll help make sure that you've got the market cornered. Now let's look at a third way that you can make sure that the formulas you're using are as confusing as possible. What we can do is we can rearrange things mathematically. So I'm gonna use this formula for the standard error as an example. As you probably remember, the standard error is simply the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now I could write it in that simple way, or I could move things around so that things are mathematically equivalent, but the formula looks different. So for example, I could square the top and take the square root of both the top and the bottom. So now my standard error would be equal to the square root of the variance divided by n. Another way to do it is I could take the s out and multiply s times one over the square root of n. And that's mathematically equivalent as well. And using the, basically these same principles, but now mixing it up between the variance and moving things in and out, I could do the square root of s squared times one over n, or I could say s times the square root of one over n. All of these are mathematically the same, but they look really different, and some of them look more complicated than others. So that's three ways to really complicate the formulas that you're trying to use. To show you the kinds of magic that you can do with this, I wanna show you just how far you can make this go. So I'm gonna take the independent samples t-test formula for the pooled variance. On the top here, we have the pooled variance is equal to sum of squares of group one divided by the degrees of freedom of group one plus the sum of squares of group two divided by the degrees of freedom of group two. Now you can see why this is a problem because people are gonna be able to sort of wrap their head around this. They know what adding is, adding is easy. Dividing sum of squares by degrees of freedom, if they know anything about standard deviations, they've done that before. So this is too easy and people are gonna catch on. So what do you do to complicate things a little bit? By using the rules that I've just shown you, you can do some substitutions and some mathematical rearranging and you can really make this complicated. So look at the bottom here. Look at the bottom here. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful mess? You basically can't even tell anymore that it's just sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom like you would expect. Most textbooks I've seen use this version of the formula. I think because it makes sure that students have the hardest time understanding what's actually going on. Okay, so I hope you can see that there are lots of ways to make formulas look way more complicated than they need to be, but really the underlying concepts are the same. And if you can solve the basic level, which is things like sum of squares and degrees of freedom and calculating means, then you can solve the rest of it. If this video has been helpful, hit like, subscribe. We've got more content on the way. And until next time, keep thinking.